Welcome back to New Rockstars. This is a breakdown of the new trailer for Blue Beetle, the DC superhero movie coming this August. I'm Eric Voss, here with WookieLeaks co-host and friend of the channel, Hector Navarro. Yeah, I'm here. And just like we said right before we started rolling, we're do do doing it, Eric. We're here, we're man. <laughs> we are going to break down this trailer frame by frame for all of the Easter eggs and visual details that you might have missed. So let's get started. Excuse me, Mr. Reyes. Finished scraping the gum off that lounger or what? Okay, the trailer opens with Jaime Reyes, Xolo Maridueña, with his sister Milagros, Elisa Escobedo, working at this mansion, and we get this great fake out where for a moment it seems like Jaime is like he's a Bruce Wayne level billionaire, but his whole suit is the uniform of the cleaning staff. It's similar to the gag we saw in Shang-Chi, that trailer where they made it seem like it was Shang-Chi in the sports car, but he was actually the valet. But you know what? Jaime still looks baller. I love this camera swooping, like he's alone on the deck. There's no other staff visible in this shot. It just shows how his reality truly is a symptom of his imagination, his ambition. He didn't need the suit. This guy already sees the world the way he wants it to be. Very relatable, Eric, very relatable. And just to give you all a bit of background on who this character is, Jaime Reyes was created by writers Keith Giffen and John Rogers and artist Cully Hamner. And he made his first appearance in the comics in 2006 in the third issue of the universe shattering Infinite Crisis miniseries. Two issues later in the same series, Jaime first appeared as the Blue Beetle. This was all to set up his new ongoing series where Jaime would take the stage as the title superhero. Jaime is also not the first character to take on the mantle of the Blue Beetle. Just like Green Lantern, the Blue Beetle mythos has a long history that dates back to the golden age of comics, but we're gonna get more into that in a little bit. Yeah, and back in the trailer, we see that a plane is landing over the beach in Palmera City. It's a fictional city in the DC universe, like Gotham, Metropolis, or Central City, but in the comics, Jaime spends most of his time in El Paso, Texas. Before you know, he, he said that he's going to move on to Palmera City for the summer after his graduation. But they did shoot a lot of this in El Paso with these beach shots, I believe were shot in Puerto Rico, but a beach by the airport does remind us a lot of Miami Beach where planes land at MIA going right over the beach. And every time I land at MIA, I'm like, oh, cool, I can't wait to hang out here. But it's like, no, no, you're going to connect to Jacksonville, Florida. Have fun, <laughs> idiot. Welcome to Miami. Bye, Eric. <laughs> Adios, Miami. But the jet has this awesome, colorful underside. And it might just be me seeing this, but there are spots that look like like eyes similar to the pattern that you see on some beetles that are designed to ward off predators who see the spots and think that they're the eyes of a large animal. Even the planes in this universe are getting on this beetle craze. I love Absolutely. it. Absolutely. It's a very colorful universe now, thankfully. Jaime and his sister sit on their rooftop looking at Palmera City towering on the horizon where Jaime says that everything feels so out of reach, which might be a clever reference to the blue beetle lore, or it might be us looking too much into things as per usual. And I like how production designer John Billington has made it a Gotham or Metropolis in its own right. It's yeah. filled with vibrant hues added with these neon lights, but the same colors we see covering the homes in Jaime's neighborhood, which might be called the Keys, which is the same as the oldest part of Palmera City in the comics. But all these colors are done with paint here. They don't need the bright neon lights. They just do it the way everyone else does. Now, throughout this film, one feels like Jaime could be destined to wear this suit and see through its eyepieces just based off the color of the world as it is in the first act. And I like how you can just make out Ace Chemicals over there on the left side. Hopefully the Palmera a branch of Ace Chemicals covers its chemical bats. Uh-oh, villains be falling into bats. You gotta watch where you fall, man. <laughs> So the tallest purple skyscraper is Cord Plaza, where Jaime shows up for an interview supported by his whole family. Jaime has to wear his school blazer, something I'm sure he feels nervous about, but he looks great. Hire this man, Cord, hire this man. That's right, give him a chance. I like how this upward looking shot from the ground doesn't even show the tower's full height compared to the wide shot that we saw before. It gives this building's architecture a menacing, deceptive quality. Oh, absolutely. And the name Cord comes from Ted Cord, who debuted not in DC Comics, but in Charles Comics in 1966 and was the previous possessor of the Scarab, but never himself had superpowers. Instead, grad student Ted Cord would use his brilliant inventions to fight crime, including his awesome VTOL, that's vertical takeoff and landing vehicle called Bug. Later in 1983, DC Comics would acquire the Charlton Comics cast of characters like Captain Adam, Nightshade, The Question, Peacemaker, who's now played by John Cena in the DCEU, and of course, Blue Beetle, Ted Cord. All of these characters were originally pitched to DC in the 80s to be used by writer Alan Moore in a new comic miniseries, but DC said they had other plans for the Charlton crew. So Moore co-created new characters with Dave Gibbons for their 
groundbreaking Watchmen series loosely based on the Charlton superheroes like Night Owl, who was based on Ted Cord Blue Beetle. Interesting history there. But here, instead of Ted Cord in this movie, we are getting the character's sister in the comics, Victoria Cord, played by Susan Sarandon. Victoria is the CEO of Cord Industries and was introduced in Blue Beetle Graduation Day issue number two, which just came out in February of this year by writer Josh Trujillo and artist Adrian Gutierrez. Victoria is going to be, we assume, uh, in this movie, kind of a corporate villain in the vein of Lex Luthor. Now, does this mean we're going to get a tease for where Ted Cord could be in the DCEU? Hmm? Oh, hmm? I don't know. We've been here hearing rumors that it's going to be Ted Lasso. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That'd be a little too on the nose, I think. <laughs> the color coding of Cord Plaza is strict. Like, notice every employee has to wear purple tones. We see lavender ties and blouses, blazer skirts, really lean into that colorful, almost speed racer-like saturation of this world. Even the security guards chasing Jenny have purple K logos. Absolutely. It definitely reminds me of Royalton Industries in the movie Speed Racer with all that purple. But Jenny, it seems, has stolen the scarab from the Victoria Cord and handed it off to Jaime in this burger carton. Big Belly Burger, a fast food chain from the DC Comics, technically a subsidiary of LexCorp. The logo is based on the Bob's Big Boy Burger Chef. Now, the scarab latches onto Jaime's face and we get 50 seconds of pure horror. They did not need to go this hard, actor. It is so wild. <laughs> so we're gonna break this down frame by frame to point out all the little horror parallels. Yes, and I know this was your favorite part, Eric, so I know you're enjoying this very, very much, but the face latch is totally an alien xenomorph face hugger, and George Lopez plays yeah. Uncle Rudy with the best hair and goatee I've ever seen, and he gets zapped across the room showing his shorts and red high tops. Once the comic relief goes down, you know there's there's nothing left but unfiltered gore. Yep, no one to crack jokes. We're just all here to scream from here forward. The exoskeleton bulges out of his back. It burns through his sweater. Everyone is screaming as he is flown up to the ceiling, just like a John Carpenter's The Thing during that horrifying blood test scene. And Jaime's body initially falls limp, making him look briefly as a corpse. The acid covers his hand and burns off his clothes as Jaime screams. It drips off. Look at those shoes. They're dripping. The fluid looks like the discharge some beetles are known to excrete as a defense mechanism. And there's your animal fun fact. <laughs> and Jaime screams in pain as a sludge is covering his head and his eyes and his nose, his freaking teeth. And I think the creepiest reference, Hector, that I think is actually happening here is from another DC movie, Superman 3, when that supercomputer becomes self-aware and it ensnares Vera, transforming her into that cyborg, and she screams as her skin is being covered in wires and metal plating. I hate it. I'm sorry, everyone, for the nightmares here, but James Gunn promised gods and monsters, that's what DC is. Yeah, that's exactly what DC is. Jaime is now looking up at his family through a heads-up display with alien writing. We don't have any basis for which to translate this, but I like how on the lower right, more text data scrolls upward as the suit gathers intel on its surroundings. Everything in his view has been rendered in a fluid watercolor two-dimensional interface like animation or the panel of a comic. The Scarab voice is the one thing we're missing here. Nothing against the actress chosen, but they're going for something robotic, closer to Alexa or Siri, and I think we all like that little stinker they had voicing the Scarab in Young Justice. No, I never is. Once we fought for control, but now we are united. The Scarab that we're hearing is named Kaji Da in the comics, and it's later revealed to be a super advanced weapon created by the alien species called the Reach, and that was what that mm. reference was from maybe earlier in the trailer. The Scarab first landed on Earth in ancient Egypt, and it was accidentally imbued with magical powers. It has its own interesting comics history, but based Basically, it was entombed in Egypt for thousands of years until it was found by an archaeologist character that we're going to talk about later. Now back to the trailer, it's cool to see that the blue scarab shell not only taking over his entire body, but just really pieces of it, like armor, leaving the rest of him exposed with this kind of under armor layer, colored brown or mauve. For contrast yeah. to the blue, it's like the staining from the sludge. And so this way, when he talks, his jaw actually moves. It's closer to Deadpool than to Iron Man. Flexibility allowed by that lower layer, and it allows the character Blue Beetle to emote more of a personality when he is suited up. And then we see the beetle wings detach into rocket boosters and blast it through the roof. And just listen to this section here. Oh. Oh. Oh, Re-entry systems ready. Wait, 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 wait. 
Yes, Jaime's suit takes them into space, and we love that all you hear is Jaime's own voice and his AI talking back to him. The suit's thrusters do not make any sound because in space, no one can hear Jaime scream. I know you would love to say that, Eric. I knew it. I knew you were gonna love to say that. Now, April is Earth Month, which makes it the perfect time to consider the impact the choices you make have on the planet we all have to share. One easy way to reduce your waste and impact is to use HelloFresh. HelloFresh is an amazing meal delivery service with 40 recipes and over 100 seasonal and convenience items to choose from each week. With so much variety, there are options for everyone and every lifestyle. And it doesn't matter whether or not you're an iron chef, HelloFresh's foolproof recipes arrive pre-proportioned and easy to prepare in just a few steps. HelloFresh's pre-proportioned ingredients cut down on your food waste by at least 23% compared to grocery shopping. Besides, HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% cheaper than takeout. On average, HelloFresh meals have a 31% lower carbon footprint than the same meals made from supermarket ingredients. Plus, nearly all HelloFresh packaging materials are curbside recyclable in most areas of the United States. States. Plus, it tastes great. This week, I got some pork tenderloin, the apricot Dijon mustard sauce. Mwah, 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 mwah. Tenderloin? More like tender foin. I hate myself. So to get started, go to HelloFresh.com and use the code ROCKSTARS50 for 50% off, plus your first box ships free. Once again, that's H-E-L-L-O-F-R-E-S-H.com and get 50% using the code ROCKSTARS50. Next, we see the family, along with Jenny, entering what is probably a high-security cord facility as she explains what the Scarab is. Milagros wears a similar auto body shop shirt as Uncle Rudy, with Reyes on the label, making this the family business. And while sitting at the Reyes family dinner, Dinner table, Jenny explains how the scarab works or doesn't work while we see it in action protecting Jaime from an oncoming bus. Reminiscent again of that great sequence in Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Hopefully no one was hurt on that bus. It also reminds us of the way Doctor Strange bisected a bus with magic in Multiverse of Madness. Leave public transportation alone, movies. Superhero movies specifically. And in his scarab vision, that's that's what I'm gonna call it now. I'm sure it won't pending. Have a there name. we go. New uh, rock stars right there. <laughs> <laughs> but as, as he looks at the bus. It identifies several passengers one by one in yellow on the left side. It includes this guy standing with a hat and the woman seated in front of him who I think is the baby in her lap. So it's like the scarab is identifying, don't hurt these people. There are mm. people here, 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 and here, here. Just be careful. Just go down the middle. Also, that meter bar on the right has a few nodes reduced well, from the shot of the family before. Maybe this is like the suit's health or structural integrity meter. I love We're that. We're figuring it out. We're figuring I love it that. Out. Very, very video game specific detail. Another great detail yeah. here yeah. is that time seems to be slowing down for Jaime, either through the Scarab's abilities or just the stylization of the movie itself. But during this moment, we see Blue Beetle putting his hand up to his mouth in shock, kind of like when Deadpool sarcastically does the same thing. But back <laughs> to the bad guy, Susan Sarandon's Victoria Cord monologuing about how the Scarab chose Jaime, but that it belongs to me. We wonder if there will be any mention of how the Scarab may have belonged to Ted Cord, but like in the comics, Ted could never really get it to work for him, which is why he relied on his own tech and gadgets. And and then we see a tower of red energy powered batteries, similar to the human batteries in the Matrix movies, line up a tower and power something up, perhaps a Victoria Cord version of the Blue Beetle suit, maybe a Red Beetle even. I don't know, I feel like we're just Ooh. spitballing and writing a generic superhero movie here. I don't know, Eric, what do you think? It does sound possible that could be where it's going. It is just hard to make out what this is. I like that Matrix comparison there because it did remind me a lot of those human farms, but at the bottom of the frame, there is an open elevator door with a few few people in there. Mm. So I think one of them might be Jenny. It's hard to tell, but maybe we're looking at Victoria Cord's attempts to replicate or just siphon the Scarab's energy source. But then there's also an interesting shot of the Scarab floating in a nebulous energy field. Kind of seems like it's something part of a montage explaining the Scarab's origin. Maybe we're going to find out how it was an enemy, the antagonist to the Green Lantern Corps. Oh. They're going to tie in the Green Lantern Corps into this movie. That I think that'd be, be an interesting true. way to go. That could be very true. Underpinning that feeling of unease that we feel, we see highly advanced drones, the staple of any tech-based movie bad guy of the past 10 years, as the Reyes family gets caught in the crosshair of their SWAT armor-wearing security force, probably a part of Cord that is looking for Jaime and his alien suit. And a great shot of one of the villains of the film, the very Michael Keaton vulture looking Raul Max Trujillo as Carapax, the indestructible man, a Blue Beetle supervillain who in the comics accidentally has his mind transferred into the body of a robot. So it should be a pretty good fight, I think. Carapax is saying that the love Jaime feels for his family makes him weak. And we all know how that's gonna turn out for the bad guy, okay? We all saw Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. Hey. Hey. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Now there's some great shots of Blue Beetle infiltrating some underground bad guy complex. Might be that one in the island that we see that the bug flying toward. He's kicking ass and kicking ass. Like he flips his soldier while the guy is still in the air and then he kicks him against the wall. And I just gotta hand it to the whole suit design, the, the costuming team to make this suit light up blue so that we could see it so well, even in this darkly lit red hued tunnel. It all just stands out and pops off the screen so beautifully to make every hit count. Absolutely. Very, very smart of them. Then we see something that makes us incredibly happy. George Lopez's character, Dio Rudy, flying one of the most famous vehicles in the DC universe, the bug. Let's just hope that after mm. the very inspirational words of wisdom that Rudy gives Jaime, that he doesn't suffer the same fate as Peter Parker's Uncle Ben, okay? Can we just, can <laughs> we spare some uncles, please? Can we keep some Theos in this superhero universe? Agreed, agreed. Let's let the man live. Now, Blue Beetle uses a hammer-shaped fist to pound what looks like an RPG to the ground. He's standing in front of some interesting looking blue energy source in the hallway behind him. I can't really make out what this is yet, but Milagros cries over the body of someone, maybe a certain adult family member, maybe your father. We don't really know. We're very worried. She's worried. The home explodes, maybe from some of those drone attacks from Cord. But as she looks at the house behind her on the street, doesn't that look like Blue Beetle? crumbled on the street there. I'm very worried. Could this be. Is, this, I'm horrified. Could be, I know, it could be. <laughs> <laughs> but then on to the trailers, needle drop. You gotta love this. Whatever you can imagine, <laughs> I can create. Let's party. Ah, ah, yeah! Nice choice. I just wanna laugh. Oh my God. I love that initial fling of the blade from his left hand. Reminds me of that T-1000 and Terminator 2. But then he, he's just like, no, no, I can do better. And he slaps his hand together with his other hand to make that big ass sword, super impractical. But you know what? Perfect for the character. Perfect I love it. for the character. What a great moment. Reminiscent of Power Rangers, I think. I think that's the moment uh -huh, of the trailer. Uh -huh. And we have finally arrived to the shot that all Blue Beetle fans are gonna be going nuts over, Ted Kord's lab, which includes not just his Blue Beetle suit, but the original Beetle, Dan Garrett's suit as well. So a little more comics history here as we keep going back through time. In 1939, the very first iteration of the Blue Beetle, a character named Dan Garrett, appeared in not DC Comics, not Charlton Comics, but Fox Comics. And Dan Garrett was originally a non-powered vigilante, kind of like the Green Hornet, but at one point started to drink a mysterious chemical that gave him superpowers, and thus continuing the American tradition of superheroes getting their abilities through steroids. Charlton Comics <laughs> apparently bought the rights to Blue Beetle and eventually made their own version of Dan Garrett, who debuted during the Silver Age of Comics in 1964, this time with a last name with two Ts. This Dan Garrett was an archaeologist who found a <laughs> mystical scarab in Egypt that gave him superpowers like flight, super strength, and the ability to fire energy blasts. That same scarab that eventually became Jaime's and was revealed to be not supernatural, but extraterrestrial in origin. And Charlton Comics also kept Dan Garrett around as the professor of, you guessed it, grad student Ted Cord, who, like we said, first appeared not long after in 1966 and continued his mentor's legacy until he met his gruesome end in 2005's Countdown to Infinite Crisis in the pages of DC Comics. But now, currently, Ted Cord is also alive in the mainstream DC Comics universe, so we got all the Beatles, y'all. Lastly, we cannot forget to highlight the hilarious moment where Uncle Rudy calls Batman a fascist which can definitely be seen as just a funny throwaway line, but it could also be seen as a point of view of how some non-white communities of the fictional DC Extended Universe might view a powerful and connected, brutally violent white vigilante with no oversight, branding prison inmates and blowing up portions of Gotham City. If this universe is still the same one where the DCEU's Batman was active for as far back as the 1990s. It's always interesting to see how the normal denizens of superhero universes feel about their over powered protectors. So let's maybe not dismiss Rudy right off the bat. He's got some wisdom. We have established this. Plus, Eric, this line has made a lot of real dumb dummies mad on the internet. So I love it. <laughs> I, it's super fun. I, you know, if calling Batman a fascist offends you, just chill. In the universe, characters are allowed to have different perspectives of characters without an entire studio saying we are endorsing this point of view. But you know what? It does feel a little weird to see Batman fighting alongside an army of cops in The Dark Knight Rises. Like, I get it. I get it for that movie. It's just weird to watch now. Like, I wouldn't <laughs> want to follow 
follow those victorious cops to a second location. Like, <laughs> hey, we won. Now let's go to the Narrows and make them all pay. And I'd be like, make who pay at this point? He'd be like, you know, you know, you know, them. Them. <laughs> I agree. And a great shout out by DC at the end of this trailer to some Blue Beetle comics. If you're interested in learning more about Jaime, you should go check out Infinite Crisis, Blue Beetle Jaime Reyes Book One, which is a great collection of some of his earliest comics, and Blue Beetle Graduation Day, issues one through five, which are out now. Yep, yep, yep. Now, that was everything that you might have missed in this Blue Beetle trailer. Hector, I'm super pumped for this movie. I'm so excited. Me too. I think it's gonna be a blast. Me too. It looks like it's so much fun in the best absolute possible way that we can imagine. Cannot wait to watch it with all of my friends in August. In August. August can't come soon enough. Now, a reminder to subscribe to our new channel, The Deep Dive, and you can support this growing network by grabbing some merch at nerdriot.shop. Follow me at EA Voss. Follow Hector at Hector is Funny. Follow New Rockstars. Subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching, everyone. Bye!